Good morning and thank you for joining us. My name is Tina Tebow and I will be your moderator for this morning's media briefing. Joining us today, <clears throat> the Honourable Randy Delory, Minister of Health and Wellness. Minister Delory will give brief remarks and will, will then be available for media questions. Go ahead, Minister. Thank you, uh, Tina. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you for being here. Uh, this has been one of the most challenging times in our province's history. COVID-19 has altered our re reality. This pandemic has caused pain and suffering for so many, especially for long-term care residents, staff, and their families. And this occurred in particularly at Northwood. I understand that families are still grieving the loss of loved ones. I understand that staff will continue to face challenges as they go to work. And I understand that residents and their family members want to spend more time together, but also continue to live with the worry of keeping everyone safe. We have 133 long-term care homes in our province, nine licensed facilities, had either a resident or staff member test positive with COVID-19. But it was Northwood that had the majority of cases and deaths. It was Northwood residents, staff, and families that felt the brunt of this virus in Nova Scotia. That's why I asked for a full review to determine what happened at Northwood. I want to thank Dr. Latta and Dr. Stevenson for their measured approach and careful examination of the outbreak at Northwood and all of the stakeholders and individuals who participated and provided their input through this process. I also want to thank the health and wellness staff, the Nova Scotia Health Authority staff, and all of the partners who worked uh, on the review of infection prevention and control measures within the broader long-term care sector. Together, you've given us insight into the issues at Northwood and across the long-term care sector. These reports are consistent in their findings. They acknowledge the measures that were put in place in advance of the pandemic and during the first wave, but they also point out the challenges. And most importantly, they give us recommendations for improvements. Some of these recommendations include improving infection prevention and control within the existing architecture at Northwood, reviewing and updating pandemic plans, creating a mobile infection prevention and control team to support facilities facing outbreaks, addressing staffing challenges with more employees for housekeeping, resident care, screening and visits, and human resources plan for the sector. Clarifying roles and responsibilities within the Department of Health and Wellness and the Nova Scotia Health Authority. Restructuring the disaster response teams and improving communication throughout. And we agree with the recommendations and the intentions uh, from these reports. Some of the work to implement recommendations is already underway and we're pursuing many others immediately to ensure our long-term care facilities are better prepared for a second wave of COVID-19. We're taking the following actions immediately with the aim of having them in place before a second wave hits in Nova Scotia. We will establish a mobile infection prevention and control or IPAC drop team in each zone. This is a multidisciplinary team of experts that can be deployed to provide extra support to facilities that are facing outbreaks. We will ensure that each zone has an IPAC resource person dedicated to supporting long-term care facilities. We will ensure that each zone has additional occupational health and safety resources. And we will ensure long-term care staff can get tested and back to work as quickly as possible to help alleviate staffing challenges during an outbreak. We'll be providing funding for small capital projects and equipment purchases to support IPAC in long-term care facilities. Things like lock boxes and carts for medications, additional hand sanitizing stations, personal protective equipment or PPE carts, room dividers, and more. We'll provide funding to support additional cleaning, 
which could include hiring additional staff or purchasing additional supplies. Beyond the IPAC drop teams, we'll provide funding for other staff who can be deployed as needed to support in an outbreak. We'll provide funding so that facilities can provide the specific care required for residents who have COVID-19. We'll continue to work with facilities to ensure that they have no more than two residents per room. And the support we're providing for increased cleaning will also help with the IPAC needs in bedrooms and bathrooms. We provided personal protective equipment for COVID-19 to long-term care facilities and home care agencies during the first wave, and we will continue to do so. Also, during the first wave, we developed a toolkit that was shared throughout the long-term care sector. Both reports noted that this was a very useful uh, kit. This will help us work with facilities to develop more robust pandemic plans and prepare for staffing challenges before the second wave. A longer term project that will get underway as quickly as possible is to build upon that toolkit to develop a robust IPAC program for the long-term care sector. It will include education and training, online learning platforms, resources, tools, and best practices, monitoring and reporting, and guidance for outbreaks and surveillance. We plan to invest about $26 million in the current fiscal year to support these recommendations and $11 million over the next two years to advance actions to help prevent the spread of COVID-19 in our long-term care facilities. Thank you, and I'll take uh, questions now. Thanks, Minister. Again, just a reminder, we'll take media questions from the room first, and then we'll go to the phone lines. You will each get one question and one follow-up. We'll start with Keith Doucette from the Canadian Press. Go ahead, Keith. Uh, I'm wondering how quickly we can get most of these recommendations by the, the two doctors in place. What's the intention of the department? So the intention is uh, a, uh, f and some items were things that were implemented through uh, the first wave. Uh, just for example, uh, the notion of a centralized uh, personal protective equipment or PPE uh, distribution. Uh, that's something that we uh, implemented through the first wave, and the recommendation is to continue that. So that that that's in effect. Uh, other uh, items in terms of staffing up and uh, building uh, the drop teams and uh, having dedicated uh, infection prevention and control practitioners, specialists uh, available uh, throughout the sector uh, will, of course, require the time to, to do the hiring. Um, but we have the resources, the financial resources uh, ready uh, to begin that process immediately. Go ahead with your follow-up, Keith. I'm still wondering, though, on the, on the 17 recommendations, what do you think of the, the timeline is for the province to get them all in place? Oh, for all of them? Oh, uh, at this point, I don't have a, a, a final deadline. Uh, some of the items, particularly the long term, longer term items, which gets into the area of legislative uh, uh, modernization and, and changes, uh, that's going to take some time to to analyze and and get uh, uh, assessed as to what specifically uh, needs to be addressed within there and how to best go about doing that. Uh, so uh, those, um, I guess, larger that require a lot uh, more research. Once we have that assessment done, we'll we'll have a better idea of timing for uh, implementation of, of those pieces. However, I think when you look at the breakdown of the the more short or immediate term uh, items that are in the recommendation. Recommendations. Um, many of those build up into the longer term, so there are things that we can do to uh, help improve communication and, and, and workflow without the legislative change. The legislative change just really locks in what those uh, best models would be. So um, I think we'll, we'll get to a, a good place with the, the immediate uh, actions, um, but there's work, uh, so I don't have a deadline for everything. Next, we'll go to Shana Luck from CBC. Go ahead, Shana. Minister, I'm wondering about Northwood's proposal to move to single rooms that has been on the table for a while. Where does that stand? And with the benefit of hindsight, what is the government's position on not having moved on that sooner? So I think that uh, gets into a, a, a number of uh, factors. Uh, first and foremost, uh, the review that was uh, conducted at Northwood um, has not uh, indicated that uh, a move to uh, full single rooms uh, was, um, you know, uh, 
uh, uh, in and of itself something that would have uh, prevented uh, the infection outcome. We've, we've seen people in, in single rooms uh, get uh, infections. So uh, what we have as a province is uh, since about 2007, uh, our standards uh, in place are for building and renovating uh, constructions, uh, including the over 100 uh, new uh, beds that we're building within the province uh, that are uh, building to single room uh, standards. Uh, we currently have, uh, I think, uh, over 55% of our uh, rooms in the province are single rooms. So that's something we've been working on as a province and we'll continue to do so. Uh, what they have highlighted uh, was, uh, I of course, a need to uh, improve uh, infection prevention controls, variables that can be uh, managed within the environment that they that is there today. And uh, so that's where a number of the specific recommendations will improve. Uh, the other piece is that we're certainly uh, committed. Uh, we know that we have uh, just over 30 uh, rooms uh, across our uh, continuing care sector that uh, have more than two uh, beds uh, in those rooms and we'll be working to uh, bring our entire sector uh, to no more than uh, two rooms uh, per, per, uh, per bedroom, two beds per bedroom. Go ahead with your follow-up. So Minister, just to, uh, to make sure I understood you, you said there are 30 rooms that have more than two and so uh, how, how many homes, how many residents um, and how does that affect? And how soon do you think that can be done? So that's something we're going to be mo moving on uh, immediately. And that's, uh, again, those 30 rooms are across the entire sector, across the entire province. Um, so uh, keep in mind we have uh, over 7,000 uh, beds. Um, so it is a, a small portion of the total, but it is a, a step that we will be taking. Uh, and uh, the action will be uh, starting um, to work with those facilities to uh, manage the occupancy and the, the licenses accordingly. Um, so that work will be uh, beginning right away. Next we'll go to Alicia Drous from Global. Go ahead, Alicia. Um, in addition to the sharing of rooms, we've heard actually that one of the more problematic things was sharing a bathroom. So you've made the commitment to not have um, any more than two people per room, but what about a commitment to the reduced sharing of bathrooms? Is there so that's uh, one of the things that uh, Drs. Latta and Stevenson uh, noted uh, through their work in the Northwood Review, uh, the, the recognition that uh, within uh, facilities, the, the built environment, there are some uh, limits. So you have recommendations that have uh, us take steps to reduce um, the risk of cross-contamination within those uh, shared washroom environments and uh, so that is uh, work that uh, we'll be uh, pursuing. So you're not reducing the number of people who share a bathroom? Well again, you, you require a certain number of uh, washroom facilities. Um, what uh, the recommendations are, are focused on is how we reduce uh, the risk of, of cross-contamination within there um, and uh, how uh, the built environment can support and infection prevention control uh, steps uh, and that includes uh, some of the investments uh, that uh, we have targeted towards capital um, but uh, again it, it would depend on each um, facility as to what um, what capacity or opportunities may exist ar around uh, the actual built environment. Next we'll go to Bruce Frisco from CTV. Go ahead, Bruce. Cleaning has come up uh, a, a few times. You've mentioned it and it's in the reports here. What, what's your message for families who've expressed concerns that uh, cleaning was an issue at Northwood and, and now we know it was? Yeah, when within the entire uh, sphere of uh, our COVID response, uh, you're right, the uh, reviewers uh, acknowledged that um, uh, as we operationalized enhanced um, infection control measures, which meant enhanced uh, cleaning, uh, coupled with a reduction in staff availability uh, at the uh, site that um, other certain tasks that would have been the routine um, cleaning uh, operational work uh, was uh, lower down on the priority list. Uh, but uh, what I think is important is that the uh, staff uh, that were uh, operating were operating and uh, pursuing 
uh, those uh, tasks that were seen as most important and critical to uh, preventing the infection and, and spread uh, within the facility, uh, and that uh, efforts were made to replace staffing uh, to ensure that uh, they had the support they needed uh, on site. Uh, what the report does make recommendations, though, uh, is uh, important to uh, have that aspect of staffing and not just our uh, direct personal care staffing as, as part of our, our pandemic uh, planning and response, uh, recognizing that the cleaning uh, staff, household staff are a critical part of the, the support um, operationally, uh, including in a, an outbreak time. Planning to hire more cleaners and yeah, that's one of the uh, investments that uh, we've committed to uh, is uh, to support, and that, and that could be hiring additional staff of, as facilities need, or uh, additional supplies, and uh, and then some some capital investments as well. Next, next we'll go to Brian Flynn from All Nova Scotia. Uh, Minister, I'm wondering why it is that the, the government's moving, um, getting rid of the the, the, the multiple uh, residency rooms uh, above two, but allowing a uh, two beds to continue. I'm wondering, is that based upon any any evidence that that is safe for residents, or is that based upon uh, the realities of the cost of, of getting rid of them? Well, as I said, uh, first, uh, the uh, ability to operationalize uh, in the immediate term, a uh, very short term, uh, occupancy above uh, two uh, is something that uh, we can work uh, as part of our, our capacity planning to operationalize uh, quickly. We already have policy in place uh, and commitments around our built environment uh, to support uh, transition with with new builds and uh, major renovations or replacements that uh, do move to a single room as the uh, kind of the default standard but I think the other thing that's important to note is the ability to um, move um, in this area is individuals uh, do report um, like having a roommate and and so forth. So uh, in in not all instances is is it unanimous a desire to uh, have a, a single room environment, and then from the clinical and the the review on um, the reports that we have was you know, that wasn't flagged as a. Um, one of the more critical uh, elements and, and uh, need to pursue. Um, so uh, we focused on uh, continuing the path we're on for builds and rebuilds. Um, we already have, uh, as I said, uh, over 50-55% uh, of our rooms, our single rooms across the, the long-term care sector. And, uh, and with the new builds that uh, come on stream, they'll be building to a single standard as well. Go ahead, Brian, with your follow-up. Specific to Northwood, there's a recommendation to reduce uh, the density in the population. I'm wondering by how much will you reduce the density in population in Northwood? So we have been operating at Northwood, uh, which occurred as, as part of our response to the outbreak that was there at a reduced uh, capacity. Um, I believe uh, early on uh, we worked to establish uh, about uh, 30 beds uh, in a COVID uh, ward to support, uh, again, anticipating a best practice for how to uh, respond to an outbreak. Um, the unfortunate reality is uh, the outbreak at uh, that location far exceeded uh, the capacity of what was uh, prepared uh, for a, a COVID uh, ward uh, to support, uh, so uh, believe we have uh, something in the in the vicinity of uh, about 90 uh, beds being held now uh, at that site, um, and uh, and they've been managing uh, well in in that regard. What the uh, you know longer term uh, permanent uh, changes may be there, uh, I think we have to have more conversations. It, it, a specific number I, I don't believe was provided in the recommendations um, so we'll, we know that the 30 wasn't enough for a major outbreak at a facility of that size and complexity um, but what the um, final number should be uh, we'll, we'll have to uh, dig a little deeper. Next we'll go to Chris Halak from News 95.7. Yeah, uh, earlier I had asked about Northwood's communication with stakeholders and it was described as largely inconsistent. I'm just wondering uh, what your thoughts are on that and what your department will do to ensure that that is addressed going forward. 
Yeah, that's um, something again during uh, the outbreak um, we became aware of in kind of real time that uh, you know we, we would hear from people concerned with the, the communications, uh, and, and there's a lot of uncertainty and, and concern there. Um, much of our focus at the time was certainly communications within within the sector and, and responding uh, to the operational needs, the needs within the facility, um, and I think uh, that's exactly what a review like this is is so. Uh, important for is to flag and identify and, and bring the recommendations that um, it's not just the clinical response that's important, uh, but also um, the response to the people um, that are also affected, uh, which would be the family members and the loved ones. Uh, so the recommendation that comes from uh, the report is uh, for us to, to the degree possible, in advance of uh, an emergency situation, uh, have it defined what kind of frequency communication to uh, family members, uh, loved ones uh, will be, um, and what types of information will be included. And, and of course, there are times there's certain information that cannot be included uh, for various other legislative reasons, uh, privacy or, or what have you. So they need to be very clear as what to, what can be shared, uh, what, what cannot be shared in advance. Um, so that in the height of a, the moment of an outbreak, uh, people aren't feeling like someone's not communicating with them. Go ahead with your follow-up, Chris. Yeah, uh, leading up to this, uh, the province faced some criticism over uh, opting for a review rather than a public inquiry into the matter, and there are still those who, even after these recommendations have been released, will still want a more transparent process into the matter. I'm just wondering what your message is to those critics. Well, I think uh, when when I announced this uh, review um, being led by by Drs. Lada and Steve, Dr. Stevenson, um, really following the quality improvement uh, process uh, was the most expedient way to get a review of of circumstances that took place and tangible recommendations that we could uh, implement um, to prevent uh, future outbreaks uh, like this at Northwood or minimize the, the risk uh, of, of a major outbreak. Uh, so this is why we chose the path that we did. Uh, I believe the, the recommendations and the work that was done um, was, was well done and uh, I think it does provide us with a good path forward uh, to, um, again, with immediate uh, initiatives that we can be and will be investing in uh, moving forward, as well as some longer-term changes that uh, are a bit more structural uh, and long-term. Uh, long Next, we'll go to Olivier Lefebvre from Radio-Canada. Merci. Um, about the communications with the families, again, do you consider as a province giving the same guidelines on communication plans for all long-term care homes in the province? Yes, yeah, so, so with this Northwood report, uh, while the review and the assessment was specific to that location and the circumstances, because that was by far and away the largest outbreak we had, um, the reviewers were focused there. But as a department, as a government in the province, uh, we are, are taking those recommendations and, and uh, internalizing them and recognize they actually can support uh, improvements across the entire sector. Uh, so we, although it's a, a Northwood review, I believe the uh, recommendations transcend that one facility. And, and you've asked specifically about communications, uh, and, and that would be uh, the same thing. I think when we work with our, our partners in the long-term care sector, uh, um, because had there been a, an outbreak at, at another facility, if they don't have that type of predefined communication protocol that the reviewers recommend, uh, I think they would have found themselves in a similar, uh, potentially in a similar situation as Northwood with, with concerns from family members uh, about whether it was uh, consistent or inconsistent communication. So I think the recommendation does uh, apply across, uh, and I think that's the case with many of them. Go ahead, Olivier, with your follow-up. Yeah, um, there's always from what we understand, going to be risk, even with the best preparation. So I'm just wondering, as the health minister, when will you feel uh, comfortable um, that the long-term care, care homes will be in the best position 
for um, second wave ready readiness? Uh, you know, that's a, a challenging question, as simple as the words make it appear. Um, but the, the reality is, um, and, and I think anyone who works in an area like infection prevention control, occupational health and safety, that is a risk-based um, discipline, uh, would tell you that you're right, as you said off the top of your question, you don't reach zero risk, but you continue to uh, pursue continuous improvement um, so that you continue to improve the situation over what it was there previously. When you have the opportunities to see lessons learned, you, you, you conduct reports and, and reviews uh, to chart a path forward. So, uh, you know, taking the actions that we're taking, I believe, will reduce the risk based upon the advice that we've been given. Um, what we know is uh, some of the um, retrospective um, awareness that th this report um, showed us is some of the actions that were taken based upon previous uh, reviews and, and, and what we thought were uh, best practices, they've identified as having some unintended consequences. And, and I'll just use for one um, the notion of, of having family and visitors within the facility and the trade-off between reducing the risk of infection within the facility um, and offsetting kind of the quality of life. Uh, for residents and and their loved ones, um, that you know by 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 closing down fully, it had uh, consequences. You know, very good for risk mitigation of infection control, um, but other uh, challenges that were presented uh, as a result. And so uh, that's why we, we continue to look for those opportunities to strike the right balance, um, minimizing the risk of infection while also respecting uh, the needs of the, uh, the the people living in those facilities and their loved ones. We'll now go to the phone lines. Again, if you're not asking a question, please ensure that your phone is on mute. We'll start with John McPhee from the Chronicle Herald. Go ahead, John. Thank you. Minister, can you talk about uh, talk more about the mobile infection teams? Uh, who will be staffing these teams? How will they be hired? How many people are we talking about in terms of the team numbers? Can you talk a little bit more about that? So this will be work uh, that uh, is going to take place um, at the zone level. So I, I guess if I uh, break it out so it, it, it makes sense, within our, our long-term care facilities, uh, we have uh, an IPAC designate, uh, someone who's uh, one of their tasks is to be responsible uh, for infection prevention control within uh, each uh, location. What uh, came out of this uh, review and the recommendations we need to, to strengthen the support for them, particularly uh, during a time of, of outbreak, uh, but also to support them uh, with uh, education and training and best practices. Um, and that type of, of staying at that level of detail, uh, really you see I, I, IPAC practitioners, um, really uh, highly skilled uh, professionals uh, in this area. So we'll be building uh, capacity within our zones to have uh, IPAC uh, practitioners uh, who will support facilities uh, throughout the zones. When there's a, a, an incident or an outbreak uh, and a facility's uh, IPAC designate uh, thinks they need to reach out for help, they would go to uh, this uh, individual, this zone representative uh, who has more training. While they work together, if they need even more support uh, around infection prevention control and whether it's on education, training, preparation or response, uh, they can uh, tap into uh, a team, uh, and that's the IPAC drop team that uh, we've, we've referenced. That team then uh, may be multidisciplinary and, and uh, tap into uh, occupational health and safety, infection prevention and control, clinical, uh, as well as uh, other on the ground expertise. Um, but it would be built to respond to the specific situation. Um, but they would be uh, available to be tapped into uh, and come together to support the needs um, uh, of people. So, so that's the uh, infection prevention control, kind of that, that stepped level of support uh, that would be made available. Go ahead, John, with your follow-up. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Latta described Northwood as a small city with complexities that exacerbated the outbreak. Uh, obviously, facilities of this size are problematic. Do you have any plans to eventually close Northwood? 
So that's uh, not a plan uh, that's uh, come up. Uh, again, uh, the recommendation is talked ab about uh, maintaining um, a lower occupancy rate. Uh, we have been doing that uh, throughout uh, the first wave, um, again, managing with um, uh, a COVID ward uh, so they could respond. Uh, I believe it was about 30 beds that they, they were working to uh, support an outbreak. Uh, that wasn't enough, so the uh, panel uh, does recommend uh, keeping the occupancy lower, although I don't believe there's a specific uh, count. Uh, I think we've been running at about 90 beds uh, uh, since the first wave uh, reduction, so uh, we'll dig in a little bit deeper to see uh, what the long-term uh, occupancy uh, should be uh, at that site and, and work with Northwood um, to determine uh, what uh, implications that would have for them as well. Next we'll go to Mike Gorman from CBC. Go ahead, Mike. Thanks. Minister, um, your recommendations from the out-of-province experts talk about the need to set and fund standard minimum care hours based on resident complexity across all facilities. And it refers to the Nurses' Union Broken Homes report, which has been out for, um, by my math, uh, almost six years at this point. The IPAC report that you've put out today from your own staff talks about the problems that staff levels experience as a result of low wages, poor benefits, and not enough support for people who work in the long-term care industry. And yet your news release and your own comments don't touch on any of these things. What commitments are you and your government prepared to make at this point to improve working conditions for the people who staff long-term care sites? So as it relates uh, to the specific point uh, around uh, staffing rates and, and so forth, um, that was a commitment uh, made uh, in uh, 2019 uh, when the expert panel uh, that I uh, put in, in place and in, in, uh, that they conducted their work in the fall of 2018. Um, but that recommendation, like the recommendation in uh, the Northwood uh, review, um, denotes the need to uh, conduct research to determine what exactly that needs to be. Um, so we have been working uh, on the basis of that uh, expert panel report uh, with uh, experts uh, within the sector, uh, in particular uh, the Center for Aging out of Mount St. Vincent University, uh, to help uh, dig into that uh, specific area uh, to uh, chart our path forward. Go ahead, Mike, with your follow-up. Well, respectfully, Minister, that report came out more than a year ago, and we have very tangible and, and quite frankly, dire evidence of what happens when um, those things aren't acted upon. So how long is it going to take to finally settle on something that people from within the sector have been calling for for the better part of six years? As I'd indicated, uh, we, we have uh, taken action to uh, answer the question uh, that was flagged both in, in uh, that report uh, as well as uh, the most recent recommendations. Uh, so uh, what I would uh, flag is um, as the, the recommendations out of the Northwood uh, report uh, highlight uh, the need to identify the appropriate um, ratios based upon uh, the complexity of needs of the residents. Um, it's that aspect that is uh, under review to say, how, how do we go about doing that? How do we operationalize that? Uh, and that's, uh, that's work that's uh, already underway. Uh, so we, we have uh, actioned it uh, already. Next, we'll go to Jennifer Henderson from the Halifax Examiner. Go ahead, Jennifer. Just following up, Minister, on uh, Mike Gorman's question. Uh, my understanding is that work on identifying um, level of of care, hours of care uh, for um, residents with complex needs, that that data is available from many other jurisdictions. Why why doesn't the province commit to amending the legislation based on based on work that already exists in other provinces and states? Uh, as we uh, looked at this, uh, at least in, in my tenure, uh, with a, a particular focus uh, with the expert panel report, 
uh, we, we took the, the recommendations to uh, work to uh, answer these questions um, and we uh, recognized the, the valuable uh, work within our own province uh, and so we've uh, we've been working to answer those questions. Uh, certainly uh, anytime research and reviews are, are conducted uh, they often include uh, jurisdictional scans to uh, evaluate information that's available from other uh, regions um, and I'm sure that's a part of the uh, operational work that's uh, taking place uh, with the research. Go ahead Jennifer with your follow-up. Yeah, the, uh, the purpose of both reviews were to, um, were to improve, um, were to make improvements to hopefully uh, prevent um, a second round of uh, fatalities associated with this infectious disease and uh, both reports uh, in very both reports reference the need to separate infected residents and staff from non-infected residents and staff. I haven't heard anything in your comments or the release so far that indicates how 42 percent of people who share rooms and communal bathrooms will be better protected if we have another outbreak in a long-term care facility. Well, Thanks uh, for the question. I think uh, first is that, uh, again, a uh, reminder that uh, throughout uh, the first wave um, with the 133 uh, facilities uh, that we have, um, and, and although we did have uh, infections of either staff or residents at a, a number of facilities, uh, we really had one with uh, the devastating impact, and that, that is Northwood. Uh, they uh, all carry a similar uh, structure, um, you know, those that would be built of the same uh, vintage as, as Northwood with a, a mix of, of uh, single and, and double occupancy rooms and shared uh, washroom facilities. So those same fundamental infrastructure um, uh, components existed throughout our long-term care sector uh, facilities um, and uh, continue to do so. Uh, what the reviewers, particularly of the Northwood Review, uh, highlighted was what was unique or different about Northwood uh, was not the, the distribution of single and, and double occupancy rooms, but rather the sheer size uh, and total uh, size and, and uh, occupancy of that facility, which through that size uh, leads to increased complexities um, that smaller facilities wouldn't uh, have necessarily had to, to manage through. Um, and as it uh, relates to um, the need to separate, that's where the, the notion, and, and we had this uh, planned and, and operationalized uh, through the first wave, was the ability to uh, hold vacancies within uh, facilities uh, to uh, act as, as COVID wards or uh, areas where they can uh, isolate and uh, support um, you know, if an infection uh, took place uh, within uh, a facility. What the reviewers noted uh, about Northwood, even though they had about 30 beds uh, allocated for this purpose, uh, that in fact uh, the size of the outbreak exceeded uh, the capacity that was allocated for. Uh, and we have been uh, managing with uh, a higher degree of uh, vacancies, uh, that is uh, beds that are available, to help support that uh, at the Northwood site uh, since that first wave. So uh, really I think perhaps it wasn't highlighted or stressed because it's something we've been doing uh, since the first wave to maintain uh, space and capacity uh, to help support um, isolation uh, in the instance of an outbreak. That's all the time we have for questions today. Go ahead, Minister. Thank you, uh, Tina. Thank, thank you, everybody. Uh, again, I do want to thank um, Drs. Lada and Stevenson for their work on the Northwood Review, uh, as well as uh, all staff uh, throughout uh, the healthcare system, uh, within the department, within the, the health authorities, the long-term care sector. Uh, I want to thank them in particular for their, their efforts on this review, but also uh, for the work that they do each and every day, and in particular the last uh, six months. Uh, those of us here in, in, in this room or those of you in this room uh, may not realize uh, really just how challenging um, uh, 
uh, throughout the acute as well as the long-term care sector, um, the response uh, and the challenge for, for healthcare professionals um, and, and, and their administrative teams uh, has been. So I, I thank them for the work they do each and every day and, and in particular in supporting us to ha complete these uh, reviews uh, to help improve the um, to chart a path for so we can improve the outcomes going forward. So I know that the, the review itself will no way, in no way, make up for what transpired at Northwood and the 53 lives lost. Uh, not to the staff members for whom uh, these residents were family, uh, like family, and certainly not for those family members. Uh, it'll never take away the pain uh, and it won't bring back what was lost. So while we've learned a lot a great deal through the first wave of COVID-19 and we've made improvements in real time in our long-term care. Uh, we know that there's more to be done. We know we have to do better and we're committed to doing so. Uh, it's my hope that we will learn these valuable lessons that these reviews uh, present for us uh, so that we can make the necessary improvements at Northwood and throughout the long-term care sector. And we'll be able to do that because of the recommendations that have come forward in these two reports. We want to be in a stronger position to manage a second wave, and I believe that implementing these recommendations will do just that. We know we want to ensure that our most vulnerable are safe and protected at Northwood and throughout all of our long-term care homes in the province. They deserve nothing less. Thank you.